we saw when we have some polynomial p of x, then the limit as x approaches some constant for p of x will just be p with that constant plugged in. This is because with the limit laws, you can break down the polynomial to all its pieces, and then as x runs to c, you end up with just c being plugged in with the place of x. But how about for other kinds of functions? For example, what if we have a rational function? What if we have some rational function, r of x? Remember, what a rational function is, is it's just some polynomial on top divided by some other polynomial on bottom. And so are we able to also conclude that, that the limit as x approaches some constant c of a rational function, is that just going to be plugging c in for the rational function? Well, to, to examine this, let's look at a couple examples. And the first example we'll look at is the limit as, say, x approaches 1 of x squared minus 4 all over x plus 2. Now, if you have this function, you can start using your limit laws. You say, okay, well, the limit of a quotient is just equal to the limit of the top divided by the limit of the bottom as long as that bottom does not come out to be 0. But sure enough, if you go and you break this down, you make this the limit of x plus the limit of 2, it comes out to be 3. On top, it would be the limit of x squared minus the limit of 4. The uh, limit of x squared becomes just 1 squared, so it's 1 squared minus 4 minus 3 over 3. You end up with a limit of minus 1. And so it seems like that what you get is actually the same as if you had just plugged in that original 1. Because if you just plugged 1 into this, you would have gotten 1 squared minus 4 over 1 plus 2, which is minus 3 over 3. Seems like it's the exact same thing. It seems like this holds true. But notice in this reasoning, there was one vital line. We said that this limit is the same as the quotient of the limit as long as the bottom is not zero. As long as the bottom is not zero. So, so yes, this holds if the bottom, if the limit of the bottom piece, the q of x piece, is not equal to zero. And so what happens when the bottom does come out to equal zero? Let's look at an example of that. Here, to make the bottom zero, you might consider, okay, the bottom would be zero, would go to zero as x is not going to one, but as x is going to minus one. So let's investigate that one. Let's investigate what happens. You limit as x goes, not minus one, but minus two. As x goes to minus two, it would make the bottom zero. So, so what can we do here? We, we can't say it's not simply going to be the limit of the top all over the limit of the bottom. Why? Because the limit of this bottom here is going to zero. So, so we can't use the quotient limit law. Whenever you have a division by zero, actually, if you notice the top, it's also going to zero. So we end up here in a situation where you have zero divided by zero. And this doesn't make sense mathematically. You can't be dividing by zero. So what should you do? You should take that as a flag, as an indicator that you need to do some algebra. There's probably some sneaky algebraic trick you can do in order to resolve or eliminate the division by zero. And so looking at this, what sneaky algebra trick can you think of? Like, what do you have in your algebra uh, bag of tricks? Because we happen to carry these around with us, right? So what is the algebraic trick that you can use? And I want to suggest when you look at it, it screams out to you factor, right? You have x squared minus 4. You know that thing factors. You remember from, from high school, you like 
when I have an a squared minus a b squared, that factors as a minus b times a plus b. So when you see that top as x squared minus 4, you should immediately think that's just going to be x minus 2 times x plus 2 all over x plus 2. And then look at this. You have an x plus 2 on top and an x plus 2 on bottom. So what can we do? Well, they will cancel, leaving you with just an x minus 2. Now, you should be a little bit concerned right now because this function, x plus 2, x minus 2, is not quite the same as this function up here. They are almost the same. If you plug in 3 or 7 or 152 or whatever you plug into the top function, it will be the same as the way you plug in the bottom. Because, because these pieces just cancel, it gives you the same thing, except for at one value. At this bottom function, you can plug in the value minus 2. When you plug in minus 2, you just get something out. You get minus 4. It's well defined there. But this top function, if you try to plug in minus 2, it's undefined. And so you might worry, look, this function is a little bit different than this function. At one point, at minus 2, it does something different. So will the limit still be the same? Yes, because although the functions are different at minus 2, the limit doesn't care what happens at minus 2. The limit's asking what happens when you're near minus 2. If you were to graph this original function, what would it look like? It would be identical to the line x minus 2. It, it would look just like this line x minus 2, except at the value minus 2, this original function is not defined. So at minus 2, there would be a hole there. At minus 2, it would be undefined. But notice, for all of the points close to minus 2, whenever you're getting close to minus 2 from either side, all of these points, it's behaving exactly like x minus 2. And so we can evaluate this function by just evaluating x minus 2. And when you do that, what do you get? Well, you can use your, your subtraction limit law. This would just be the limit of x minus the limit of the constant function 2. which then comes out to be, well, as x approaches minus 2, x is approaching minus 2. This, con this function is constantly 2, so minus that 2 off, and you get minus 4. Let's look at another example of a limit of a rational function that runs into a similar problem. Consider the limit as h goes to 0. I'm just using h instead of x. You could call it h or x or y. It doesn't matter what your variable is. Of the square root of h squared plus 4 minus 2 all over h. Now, notice you can't just break this up as the limit of the top divided by the limit of the bottom. Because what is the limit of the bottom? The limit of the bottom is 0. You'd be dividing by 0. In fact, the limit of the top is also 0, because as h goes to 0, you would have the square root of 4 minus 2, you would have 2 minus 2, you would have 0 divided by 0. This is a flag. This is an indicator that you probably need to do some sneaky algebra attack on this problem in order to simplify it to a place that will get rid of the division by 0 problem. And, and what our attack will be is very similar to the last one. We're going to take advantage of the fact that a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. But instead of factoring this time, because there's nothing really to factor, what we're going to do is introduce a new term. You might have heard of this as multiplying by the conjugate. It's a similar idea to this. You're going to say, I have an a minus b term. Let me introduce a a plus b. I'm just going to change this to the first term, h squared plus 4 plus the second term. Now, you can't just multiply the top of a fraction because that would change the fraction. You're changing what's happening there. But you can if you also multiply the bottom by the same thing. You can multiply the top and bottom of a fraction without changing anything. 
So we'll also multiply the bottom by this term. Why are we doing this? Because now it's of the form a minus b times a plus b. So we know that we'll multiply out to be a squared minus b squared, and that square root cancel with the square root. That is, you will get the first term squared, which would be the square root squared, so it just leaves you h squared plus 4. The square root got squared, eliminating the square root. Minus the 2 squared, which would be 4, all over as your bottom now, h times the square root of h squared plus 4 plus 2. And we're taking the limit as h goes to 0. Let's simplify a little bit. Plus 4 and minus 4 on top leaves you with just an h squared. You can then cancel one of those h's on top with the h on bottom, and you end up with the limit as h goes to 0 of a single h on top all over on bottom the square root of h squared plus 4 plus 2. Notice now we can break this up using our quotient rule. This would just be the limit of the top all over the limit of the bottom. Why can we break it up? Because the bottom is no longer going to go to zero. You can break up the bottom. You can break up the bottom and say it's limit of the first piece, limit of the square root, but the limit of the square root is the square root of the limit. So it's the square root of the limit of h squared plus 4 plus the limit of the 2. And you can keep breaking it up, breaking it, breaking it up. And what you end up with, you have the limit of the h on top. You end up with on top, your h's are going to zero. You get zero over 0 squared plus 4 square rooted, that's 2 plus 2, you end up with just 0. So the, here, we begun with the problem that if you just try to do the limit of the top divided by the limit of the bottom, you'd be dividing by 0. So to avoid that, we did a sneaky algebra attack on it that allowed us to re restructure it so that we are no longer dividing by 0, and then we could break it up and evaluate the limit.